been in this spiritual reset, and in the spiritual reset, last week, if I could say it this way, last week was motivative, mo- uh, trying to motivate you and try to emotionally draw you that it's possible to find freedom. This week, I'm just going to give you some tools, but it's going to be upon you to evaluate yourself to see what you need to do. So this, I, I'm going to, I mean, this week is practical week in the spiritual reset. In doing that, I want to do two things real quick. First thing I want to do is just look straight ahead and tell everybody who's watching us online. We're so grateful that you're joining us this morning. Uh, I know that you're out there watching. Uh, There's these little things we can go in the back door and see how many of you are out there. And our online community is growing rapidly. So we're thrilled that you're connecting with us. Please, as anytime you want to, drop us a note. And that brings me to number two. Uh, Last week, we did get some notes. Actually, we got two notes specifically from people online that was watching the sermon who actually gave their heart to the Lord because of last week's message and service. So so I just want to tell you guys this, and this is in worship. I felt impressed to do this. I want to just say thank you to everyone who that you are a financial giver and donor to the church. Two people last week gave their heart to the Lord. They weren't able to be here, but they were able to watch us. And that was because someone here wrote a check. Someone, do people still write checks? Okay, someone downloaded our app and gave digitally. Uh, I would still write checks, but I was told I wasn't allowed to anymore. So, um, but here's something else that happened this past week. Uh, I had the opportunity to be a part of a nationwide program called Ask the Pastor. And I actually heard communications as far as California of us affecting their life. And so if you're sitting in here right now and you're like, well, we're, we're a really good church in Collinsville. Actually, we're a great church in Collinsville. I got to fix that for you. But the second thing I want to tell you is that we're actually influencing people outside these four walls. Um, I think we're influencing the community. So I'm so grateful that you guys are part of what we're doing because without you, it's just me up here talking to myself which I do that, I, just so you know. But it, I don't all the time where people can see me in public, but just most of the times it's because we're on the same page and we are on mission for God to change lives. And so I just love that you, you're the heart of everyone in here. Um, the two services have been going fantastic. And no matter how much we plan to services or the future or online, here's the one thing I eventually came to grips with, though. In all of this, I'm not in control. I, I, I want to think I am, but, but how, how do you steer a runaway locomotive? Because at this point, I feel like sometimes around here, it's a runaway locomotive. Like, we're changing lives. We're in the community. We have some big, exciting announcements for some of the outreaches we do later in the year. And we're like, God, we can't believe you're having us do this. And we're out of control, but yet I'm in complete comfort because I know who's in control. And, and this is a great time for all you little Pentecostal charismatics. Ready for this? I believe that God is in control. There. Love it. Love it. I love the energy. I love the excitement because here it is. He is. And the faster that you come to grips that you're not in control is the faster you can be in control. Because you gave up control to the one who is in control. And so here's what, here's what I want to tell you. So if you are not on the Bible app, If you haven't downloaded this week's lesson coming up, I will let you know that this entire conversation of control is going to fall short on you. The next seven days are all stories about how God is in control with individuals in the Bible. The lady who's doing the seven-day reading program has a video to encourage you to point things out. But you have to get this to understand how God is in control. So this is just another cheap plug with get on. And by the way, I know a lot of you are on because my phone continues to blow up every time you read something or make another photo. And so you 4 a.m.ers that need to get up early and read your stuff, good on you. Just wait to hit end till around 7.30. Like, give the rest of us time. And then some of you, are, I, I've seen a few that's like 11.37. So they're like, oh, I got to get this done before tomorrow, right? And then at 12.05, you go ahead and knock out the next one. Just you're getting it done, but make sure to be getting it in you. But I love it because right now in this week's reading plan, I saw there was already 31 people waiting to accept the plan to be a part of one group thing. So if you're on there, make sure you register, make sure you look other people up. And this is an online community you don't want to miss out on. So we're going to be talking about proven, proven that God is in control. So here's the first thing. If you're still wrestling with the fact, well, I think I'm in control. Really? Are you in control of your thoughts? Because right now, I do not want you to think about a pink elephant. 
Don't picture a pink elephant with a nice trunk standing right over there already taking communion, playing a jazz flute. Like, don't picture that, whatever you do, right? Uh, but your control of your emotions, right? Okay, let, don't get worried in the next couple sentences. Don't worry about it's tax season and you might get a letter from the IRS. Because let's be honest, do you really know what you're doing with your taxes? Like easy form, I'll define an easy form for you. Uh, uh, here's one for you. Property taxes are going to be coming out soon. But don't worry about it. Don't be anxious. Uh, your kids one day are going to drive. I told you to control your emotion. I, you know what I need you to do? Control your behavior, right? Could everyone just stop blinking for the next five minutes? Why can't you control it? Okay, here's one for you. Uh, I need you when you leave here today to control the cars around you as you drive. Some of you are getting worse, and you need to hear this. The middle lane that's yellow, yeah, you don't drive down that. And you don't slow down in the white lane to the, get to the yellow to move over. If you don't know what it's for, come to the prayer team. They'll cast the demon of bad driving out of you, but you, you need some help. No, sir, I just need you to control the people next to you and the emotions you feel as they're swerving. Okay, so in about 90 seconds, I got you to question, can you control your thoughts, control your behavior, control your emotions, and control your surroundings? So in about 90 seconds, you're already questioning, what can I actually control? You can control how you behave when the one in control is controlling you. So here, here's why I say that. I've never had my kids, as we've been trying to take them to, to school or take them to soccer or take them to dance. I'm just kidding. My boys aren't in dance. So I'm uh, seeing if you're paying attention. Uh, I've never had them back there going, oh, Dad, are we going to make it? Oh, Dad, is the car going to be safe? Oh, Dad. They've never been back there. Why? Because they trust their father to get them to a predetermined end that we planned on ahead of time. But here's what they can control. Dad, will you turn on the music? Nope. Oh, why can't we have music? No, you can control how you behave when the one who's in control is driving you where you need to go. So there is a self of personal responsibility that we have here. But when it comes to your life, when it comes to your destiny, when it comes to where you're going, you need to control you, but you also need the one to trust the one who's in the control of your life. And by the way, who's in control of your life? God. How does he control your life? I need you to download the reading plan for this next week's, and over the next seven days, there's going to be seven different people where you see the beautiful predestined hand of God moving in someone's life in order to take them from where they are to where he wants them to be, and when he gets there, they're fully equipped to live out the destiny they're called to. And this is you. So, so I just need to tell you that God is in control. But if you still don't believe that you're not in control... Can I tell you about one key tool that you use to make you feel like you're in control? Worry. You use worry, right? Your mom, your dad, and your kids are out, and you haven't heard from them, and it's past curfew. So what do you do? You start worrying about them. And then they walk in the door. The moment they walk in the door, you go, oh, I'm so glad you're home. I'm worried about you. Like your worrying was a protective little bubble keeping them safe. Right, my, my wife takes all the kids, and I, I know I've said this before, they, she, they, all the kids are in the car, my wife's driving, and I call her, and she doesn't answer. I'll tell you now, I always worry. My greatest life treasures in one thing, and she doesn't answer back. So if I worry hard enough, I'll protect them, right? Okay, so, so here's another example, because if we worry hard enough, we can actually stop the inevitable, this is a story I don't mind sharing about myself, and I did this for you. So, so my wife, when we first had our little baby girl, my wife left. I had my baby girl upside, upstairs, and I heard the garage door open. And I thought, here's what would be funny. I'm going to take my baby girl, lay her to the side, pull the blanket off that was on her, wrap the blanket around a pillow, so now the pillow looks like a baby. And my wife came in, and I called her, and she comes out from underneath the stairs, and you can look over our balcony. And as soon as she came around, she turned and looked, and I go, hey, babe. And I dropped the pillow, not the baby. But the pillow looked like a baby. And as that pillow, slow motion, fell to the ground, and I'm up there going, because <laughs> I'm slow motion laughing, too. <laughs> this is great. My wife worried so much that that pillow levitated. And it didn't hit the ground. No, what did it do? It fell to the ground. 
Why? Because worry doesn't win over gravity. It doesn't happen like that. Worry doesn't help another car from hitting you. And right now, I can tell that some of you are sitting there judging me. I feel it. But I want to let you know I was willing to do that joke on my wife so I could give you this example so to drive home the point of worry. You're welcome. <laughs> Having said that, I've never done that joke again. I, long term it was lost. Short term gain. But here's the thing. You, you could say this. That the Bible says you can worry all that you want. It won't add an inch to your, uh, your height and it won't add a day to your life. Worry does nothing, but we worry because we're not actually in control. But we think if we're in order to control something, we need to worry about it. And, and actually worry just hurts you. It hurts your heart. It hurts your life. It hurts your emotion. It hurts your hair. I know right now you're sitting there going, um, you are, you know, you have bald-itis and you're going to about tell us about worrying and hair. Here's the thing. I can tell you when I started losing my hair. I was in a discipleship school where I was forced to be in a classroom for a year long with other Christians to try to figure out life. There was so much stress. There was so much conflict. There was so much worry. Actually, I would dare say most people would lo lose their Christian faith. But because I was carrying it wrong, my body manifests something unhealthy. And next thing you know, I'm without hair because, well, I worried. I stressed. Now, I don't mind telling you that because of this. I think God lets me go through everything because nowadays I can get through anything. I think God has equipped me during those times. And I had my counselors and my coaches and my community nearby in order to help me through those difficult times. But in those difficult times, I wonder if I would have worried less because I knew who was in control the whole time. So, so you are not in control. Give up control and trust the God who's in control. For more details, download the app. Go to the back table, get a printout, whatever you got to do, make sure to read about that. Because the next thing, by the way, control, alt, delete. I forgot in our control, alt, delete, we have a memory verse of the week that I want to share with you. So if you have your little card, I'm going to ask you to pull that out. If you're watching online, you look up 1 Corinthians 2.9 in the New Living Translation. Because how many people ever on your computer had to hit control, alt, delete? In order to do a reset. So this is where we're at today. We're going to talk about control. What do we really have control of? Alternate. Where do you need to have alternate thinking? Because your current truths are actually just lies. And they continue to uh, bug your system if you would. And the final one is what are some things in your life you just should flat delete. And in order to do that, I need you to know you can trust God. Because no eye has seen. No ear has heard. No mind can think of, fathom, imagine what God has prepared for who? For you. For those who love him. The God of your life who has his hand on your steering wheel driving you to the future that he's predestined for you, you can't imagine what's ahead of you. And even if you think it, your eyes can't believe it. And you could have someone tell you it, but your ears won't believe it. Because why could, everyone, you ready to read this with me? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. This is your verse for the week. Week number one, we learned that we have a new operating system. Why? Because I've been made new. Christ is here means the old is gone, the new is here. Last week we found out that, guess what? Some people meant to harm you. We're talking about Joseph. But even though you meant to harm me, I need to let you know this, that God meant this so I could save many lives. Today, in your spiritual reset, I don't know what you think your future looks like, but your future is going to be determined on what you think now, and what you think now needs to be this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine how much God has in store for you, what he has planned for you, what he has predestined you, because you love him. So let's talk about the next one. Here we are. Alternate thinking. Why are we loyal to systems that aren't working? We're committed to what has been handed down to us, which keeps us from evolving into what God has prepared for us. But we can't get there because we, haven't, we have these rituals, we have these ceremonies, we have these routines that actually keep us from progressing. Why do we keep doing what's broke? Why do we keep circling back to things that end up failing on us time and time again? We have to know that how we think determines how we feel. And how we feel determines how we act. 
right? So most of the times we'll keep acting the same until something comes in and rocks us to the point where we feel so bad, we go, man, I have to reevaluate how I think about something. And here's your extreme example. Man, I enjoy junk food. Man, I enjoy sugar. Man, I enjoy junk, uh, uh, soft drinks until I have a major heart attack. And the doctor says, you do this again, the next one you could die. Guess what? You emotionally hate that feeling so much that you will go back and rethink what you think food should be. Food should be a source to feed us, not a source of pleasure to, to feed us. And so in your mind, you have to start thinking different. But until we start thinking different, no matter what we do externally, we don't change who we are internally. So I'm going to give you an example, and we're going to kind of reverse engineer this. See if you can stay with me. Uh, you have an orange tree out back. But in that orange tree, you think to yourself, man, I wish it was an apple tree. So here's what we do every January 1st. We set New Year's resolutions, and we think to ourselves, I know how to make it an apple tree. We walk outside, and we start taping apples to our orange tree. Because if we change the act... If we change the fruit, if we change the result, it will somehow change the way we think. But here's what I promise you. The next blooming season that comes around, oranges are going to grow. Because you didn't change its DNA. You didn't change the internal makeup. You didn't change the way, can we say, it? the way the tree thinks. So you can do all the acts that you want externally, but eventually what's inside of you will be manifested in the world around you. Which, by the way, is a God property that you have. Do you realize that you can be like God? I know you're thinking, oh, I can be all-knowing. No, you're just a know-it-all. That's something completely different, okay? So I can be all-present. No, you really can't. We're finite beings. We're stuck right here. I can be love. Yes, you can be love just like God is. You know what you can be? You can be a creator. And why do I say that? Because when God first spoke, there was enough inside of him that when he spoke, everything came into being. And what's inside of you when you speak when you work with your hands, when you interact with the world around you, what's inside of you is being created in the world around you. So if you're living your life and you're like, man, I'm always in hostile situations. Actually, you are. I can honestly say I'm not. Well, you're a pastor. People won't be rude to you. No, you need to get out of your Christian bubble. <laughs> I'll tell you the, how pastors were treated 10 years ago and 20 years ago, completely different than today. There's, there's a lot of times that people just call me my first name and not pastor, but I promise you this, 10 years ago, it was pastor everything. It, it was the culture. It was how it is. So, so guess what? I get treated just like you get treated. Why? Because we're all humans. We're bipeds. We're just walking around breathing. And so people treat us the same. And here's the thing. If you say, well, uh, the world around me keeps failing, and I end up keep coming back to the, this thing again, and I end up blah, blah, blah. It's because what's inside of you is being created on the world around you. And in order to change the world around you, you may need to start thinking about changing what's inside of you. How do you change what's inside of you? You start thinking different. Because how you think determines how you feel. And how you feel is going to be how you act. And if you don't like the way you're acting, stop changing your behaviors and start changing your thinking. Because your thinking is setting you up for failure. Your thinking is setting you up for success. But how do you possibly think you change your thinking? I, I, I would say there's two main ways to do this. Number one, you get a coach. Number two, you get a community. So when I say coach, right now, some of you went, oh, you went new age on me, pastor. Like I need a life coach. I need a spiritual coach. I need a motivational coach. Yeah, sure do. And actually, I know you believe this because you're sitting here right now. I, I don't think, I, even though my wife thinks, I, I don't think you came here for the eye candy. Can I just say it? I, I, don't. I, I don't. I don't think you came here because our coffee bar, no matter how great our service is back there, at some point, we are just coffee bar. So I don't think you came for that. I think you came because something inside of you knows you want to be better, knows that the Bible has validity, and somehow the way I communicate it, you understand it and take it home. So can I say this? I know I'm your spiritual life coach. And a spiritual life coach, which, by the way, that is my job description. If you get in your Bible, look up Ephesians chapter 4, God has given the church five coaches, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor, uh, and 
Apostle, prophet, okay, I think I got them all. Hang on, I got to use my fingers, and here's why. So the apostle touches them all. The prophet points the way. The evangelist, he's the most offensive. Huh, I'm just kidding. He's the farthest one out. Um, pastor is married to the church, and the teacher gets in your ear. So there's your five. I'm sorry if you needed inside information how I remember that, but that's why I was sitting up here doing this the whole time. So, And you get to Ephesians, and here's our job description. We are to equip, train, and mature you guys for the work of the ministry. I know that you want me to save the world for Jesus, but we are here to save the world for Jesus. And you're here because you know life can be better, and I'm coaching you on how to do it because until you get a coach, you don't know what you don't know till they tell you what you don't know and you can know something else. That was right. Right? You don't know what you don't know. Until you get around someone, you go, do you know this? No, I did not know this. Would you like to know this? Yes, I'd like to know that. How can I know this? I know it, and I'll let you know it because I'm willing to coach you in it. So you have to get a coach in your life. If there's a place in your life where you need alternative thinking, you keep circling around the mountain. You keep finding yourself in this relationship. You keep finding yourself broke. You keep finding yourself depressed. You keep, you keep, you keep. You need alternate thinking. And then here's another powerful way. You find it in community. Um, Pastor, are you about to plug the nav groups again? Sure am. I, I, I have to. And here's why. For me, Pastor Brent, Pastor Aaron, for us to pastor you the best way possible, you have to find yourself in a small group community. I know that sounds weird. But the bigger we get, the smaller we have to become. And you find life in the small group community. If you want to know about God, the Bible, Holy Spirit, all the personal ministry, you, it, it happens in these small group communities. And then in these small group communities, when you're going through something, and I love this Rick Warren quote, they help rub it out, not rub it in. Have you ever had a knot in the back, in your back, that you needed someone just to rub it out? See, the difference between healthy community and unhealthy community, unhealthy community rubs it in your face. A healthy community says this, how can we help rub this out of your life? And when everyone else is walking away from you, those friends walk towards you. Say, why? We're here to help you find an alternate way of thinking. And the alternate way of thinking is based on truth. So if you're sitting there right now and going, well, I don't know if I believe in truth. Are you absolutely sure you don't believe in absolute truths because if you absolutely believe there are no absolute truths then there's an absolute truth proving that you don't believe in truth truth is truth here's one for you see you don't have to believe in jesus and this whole bible thing see if you agree with this one if i want money in my savings account i need to spend less than i make that sound right okay that's a truth that just is uh, here's another one for you i'm married to my wife cammy and for our marriage to stay happy, I shouldn't sleep with someone else. That, that's a truth. I, I need a lot more out of the men on that one. Just uh, all of you, just yes, amen. Why? Why? Because God tells us between one man and one woman. It's just truth. So God has truths in the Bible in order for us to learn. And if we learn these truths, can we say this? We stay on track. We stay on the right road. We, we stay behind the driver's wheel that we should because the Bible does an amazing thing. It tells us what truth is and, 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 and it tells us what's right, tells us what's wrong. And if we end up being what's wrong, it tells us how to get back on the road. And after it tells us how to get back on the road, it tells us how to stay on the road. Four key things that the Bible does in our life. And you know it because they're truth. And truth works. And so in your life, if you need an alternative way of thinking, you need to find a coach. You need to find a community. They need to speak truth into your life. And every place, and I want to read this this way, every single self-defeating truth in your life is based on a lie. So it's something that you believe. It's something that you believe, but it ends up failing you. It's a lie. You have to replace it with the truth. If not, you're just going to keep taping apples to your orange trees. And go, why isn't things getting different? Because you have to think different. So God is in control. Read about it all week long. The second thing is, where in your life do you need alternative thinking? Or where do you keep hitting the brick wall? Where do you keep failing? Where do you keep coming up short? And then the final one is, ready for this? There's a chance there's some things in your life you need to delete. 
How many would say, yep, I can name one right now of, if I didn't do this, it would be better? All right, here's a question for you. Uh, show of hands. Who would say, I have a bad habit? Okay, good. We're about, is there anyone who said no because we may ask you to leave now? Because that looked like 100%. Like, if you're perfect, man, you are not going to fit in here. So, okay, so, so we all raise our hand. There's probably a bad habit. Why is it so hard to stop something that's bad? I was thinking about it. Think about this. One, you've had it for a long time. Like, you've been doing it for quite a while. You kind of like it because it's kind of who you are, right? So maybe this bad habit ch- developed as a child, and it helped get you through puberty. Way to go. You're an adult now. Do we really need to keep doing it? Because actually, the Bible says it this way. When I was a child, I thought as a child, and I acted like a child. I did childish things. But the moment I became a man, I put those childish things aside. So, so some, I just think we've been doing it a long time. It's kind of hard to give it up. I think another reason is you identify by the bad habit. And you can't imagine your life not doing this bad habit. But here's the thing. If you can't imagine, or can we say it this way, if you can't think different, then you're not going to become different. So somewhere in your life you have to start imagining that this bad habit's out of your life because what you think determines your end. We'll get there in just a minute. But what you think matters. So can you see or be identified by something else? <clears throat> Here's one. Um, I think we have bad habits because they reward us. And what do I mean by that? So my kids, they're all over there. They're in front of the one-eyed monster that they can't look away from because someone's about to eat something gross. And they're watching TV. And I go, <clears throat> hey, kids, time to eat. No response. Hey, kids, time to eat. No response. Hey, boys, now. That's how my wife talks, not me. <laughs> I know some of you are like, yay, pastor yells at his kids. I don't. You should feel bad about yourself. No, no, no. <laughs> we are all on the same playing field here, okay? So, so here's the thing. All of a sudden, I raise my voice, the dad voice, right, and I get a response. So when I hit dad voice, I get rewarded by proper behavior. Doesn't mean it's a good habit to have, right, because later that night, time to brush your teeth, time to brush your teeth. Daggone it, kids, I will knock every tooth out of you. <laughs> Not that I would, but it, right, at some point, it's somewhere along the line, they're going to be like, he dropped a baby, now he's punching their teeth out. Like, <laughs> is this a qualified person? Uh, I, no, I, I failed the background check for Voyage. So you're in good hands. Send your kids in there. <laughs> no, no I, I, at some point, if I raise my voice and the kids respond, that's being rewarded. And guess what? Whatever gets rewarded gets repeated, Right? So now all of a sudden, some of my bad habits find results. Results feel good, so I'll do them again. And then I, probably the fourth one I'd throw out there, and I don't mean to get weird or spiritual on you, but some just could be the enemy would like you to keep it. And I'll use Satan, right? Because if I believe in God, I believe in Satan. If I believe in heaven, I believe in hell. The Bible says it. But there is a thought that there's, this may be crazy to you, but there could just be someone out there not wanting you to succeed in life. So you just kind of circle back to this thing again. So what do we do to overcome these habits? So when it comes to what you should delete, how many think we could come up with a list of 4,286 really quick? Right, because they're stuff. But I think what I want to do, I think I want to get you in a bird's eye view. I want to I raise it up as high as I can. According to God, what do you think he would point out for you to delete? And very famous verse, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And this is God talking to his people. There's a whole backstory here that I don't want to get in time, but I promise you the context that I'm using it in is an accurate one. And he says this, for I know the thoughts I think towards you. I know the thoughts that I'm having about you. I know that when I dwell upon you, when I think about you, when I turn my attention to you, God knows what he thinks, okay? And here's what he says. I have thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. So first of all, do you know that God is thinking about you? If not, I know we covered this part of uh, a couple weeks ago as we were kicking off this spirit, spiritual campaign. But God thinks about you. And we know that God says God is love. But I want to take it a step further. God likes you. I think there's a difference between us choosing to love someone and us having to like someone. So God loves you and likes you. And he thinks about you. Why? Because right here, 
How you think determines your end. It's right there in this scripture. How I think about you is determining where you're in. How you think about yourself is determining the road that you're going around. What you believe about your destiny is help setting the course of your destiny. How you think determines your end because how you think is what's inside of you. And what's inside of you is going to be created in the world around you. So it's going to have a predetermined end. If you constantly are a taker, I can promise you this, your predetermined end is not having friends because they're done, from, done with you taking from them. If you are a liar, your predetermined end are people not believing you anymore. And this isn't me putting a curse on you. This is reality. It's what's happening. What you're going to create is creating the fruit around you. But how you think determines what kind of fruit you're going to have on the outside. And when God thinks about you, here's what he's thinking. He's thinking peace and not evil. So what are things that you need to delete in your life? This is going to be up to you to decide, but I'll tell you this. If they're not thoughts of peace, they're not from God, delete them. If they're evil thoughts against you or someone else, they're not of God, delete them. Because if they're evil thoughts, God's not thinking of it. If it's thoughts of hostility, God's not thinking of it. When he thinks of you, he thinks about peace and no evil because of the determined end that you have, because he has his hand on the wheel. And if you're behaving in the back, I'm going to take you where you need to go. As you're driving down this road, if you start feeling anxious, you start feeling worried, you start feeling concerned, possibly you just need a new way of thinking because you don't believe the one who's actually in control of your life. Or there's a place in your life where you go, you know what, it's time to delete that thinking altogether. Because there are some friends, some situations, and some mindsets that will never be helpful for you. There's some things that bombard you, that hold you down, that weighed you back. That guess what? It's time just to cut the ties. And so what are the things that you just need to get rid of? Any thoughts that aren't of peace. Because there's a God in heaven that wants to take you where he's called you to. And it's not a place of hostility. And it's not a place of evil. But in these other places where you just kind of keep circling back to and you keep falling up short, your relationships keep getting thwarted, your finances keep, keep bankrupting you, your, your, your words keep hurting you, whatever it might be, there's time, it's time to find some new thinking. And you're not going to find it inside of you. It's the greatest thing about the guy in control. Oh, can I, can I tell you about something? This is fantastic. It's like this alone was worth coming. Ready? Here it is. The great thing about God is he's outside of us. So he's not going to emotionally move to have situational thinking about who you are. His law is outside of humanity. His thinking is outside of humanity. So it's not, here's an amendment. There was a time when a man thought it would be good to take millions of people to a gas chamber. And because of power and strength, guess what? His, his control won out. But outside of that, you can go to God and you go, God, you're in complete control. You tell us what's right. You tell us what's wrong. You tell us how to think. You tell us how to get the car out of the ditch, onto the road, and how to keep it on the road. Why? Because we are with you. So it's the most beautiful thing about God is in control. So here we are. To finish up, I want to ask you these questions. And nav groups, you're going to tear these apart. Because if you don't understand, the barriers that are restricting you right now are within you. I know every time something goes wrong, we want to curse that Satan and rebuke that demon and overcome that thing and throw oil and jump over and blow shofars and all that good stuff. But there's a chance some of your barriers, a lot of your barriers are from within you. So question number one, where are you trying to control where God should be in control? Question number two, where in your life do you keep circling back to a fatalistic philosophy that brings you to destruction and you need to allow God to give you an alternate thinking with the truth that he's written for us before time? Number three, where is your life not in peace? Where is your life, is there war and there's evil around it? And at this point you go, delete. Off the screen, out of my life, no longer in this operating system. And you know, what's, you know why this is beautiful? Because your eyes haven't seen, your ears haven't heard, your mind can't imagine the great things that God has for you because you love him. So hold on to that scripture this week. Believe that scripture this week as you run to your destiny while stripping off everything, every weight that would so easily hinder you from getting there. So I would say for most people, we're going to be on the same page today. But there could be some of you in here today that go, listen, I don't feel like I've still given God control of my life. Today's a perfect opportunity for that. 
If you're here, you know what's happening now because we do it every Sunday. We want to invite anybody and everybody who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to receive it today. And what does that look like? It looks like giving him control so he can help change the way that you think to constructive, not destructive, and help you get rid of the things that are killing you, that aren't bringing you peace, and that are evil. So if you're here today and you'd like to give your life to God and say, I'm ready to give up control, I'm ready to believe what they celebrate at Easter time about a man named Jesus who came, died on a cross, his blood was shed so that it could cover my sins. If that's you today, I want to give you the opportunity to say, yes, God, take control of my life. But I also want you to feel comfortable doing it. So for the next two minutes, could I just ask everyone to close your eyes? If you would, bow your heads, but you don't have to. I'll ultimately do this, kind of separate yourself so that those around you have the opportunity to respond. And the response is simply this. Are you ready to give God control of your life? Are you ready to say, I will sit in the back seat doing what I need to do, live the life. I already see those hands going up. Are you ready to give your life to God so that he can forever be the savior of your soul? If that's you right now, just put your hand in the air. I've already seen some hands go up. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, I love it. Lord, you are so good and so faithful. Hey, church, can we do this together? So many hands have gone in the air. Could we all say this prayer? Dear God, I give you control today to change my thinking and delete destructive thoughts. Become Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins and help me pursue you. And every place that I come up short, may your mercies cover me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for God, we thank you for the reset that we're on. I thank you, God, that I can see throughout the week so many people on a daily basis uh, following you. I love it, God. I love that we as a church are growing at this time emotionally, spiritually, even numerically. But, God, it's more than that. It's the influence that you're having on us so that we can influence those around us. And so, God, I thank you. I thank you for every hand that went up. I thank you for every life that made a decision today. And I pray this week as our small groups get together, as the NAV groups collaborate, as leaders talk to individuals, as our personal conversations go, I pray that every place that we need to lose control over to you, let it happen. Right now, Lord, I pray for the destructive mindsets that keep revolving us back to these fatalistic philosophies. God, give us insight on how to think new. And for every place, God, I, I just, I intercede right now for anyone who knows that they need to delete a habit, a sin, an addiction. I pray right now, God, give them the internal strength to turn to you. Not for them to overcome it by itself, but God, Holy Spirit, we need you on our side. And so right now, I pray for those that need that next step. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.